So that means for f, the arrow we have to have here, an e of f, but for conventional reasons, instead of writing e, oh, oops, it's not e anymore, right? It's p. That's a problem with editing in place. Uh, so this is p of z. Good. Now this would be P of F, but for cultural reasons we write F upper star, and similarly here we write upper star, right? And what is a functor between sets? It's just a function, right? So we just have functions between these sets. Okay, so that's one generalization of the idea of a set indexed family of sets. Now we have a category indexed family of sets. So can we, question? Are, are G star and F star functors or are they arrows? So they're arrows in the category of sets, right, which are functions. So they're functors between discrete categories as well. So they're all of those things. <laughs> it just depends how you think about it. Okay, so we had set index family of sets. We just <coughs> sort of soup that up to a category index family of sets. Can you think of another obvious generalization that we could try to do? Right, there's no reason that here, that the categories that live upstairs here need to be discrete, right? Sets are just discrete small categories. So. What we can do next is have um, oops, that, have a category indexed family of categories, and that is called an indexed category for short. And that is just a functor P contravariant from category C to, let's say, the category of small categories. It doesn't have to be necessarily this one. It could be any category of categories. But for starters, let's try that. Right, so now, P lands in cat rather than in set. And what's the difference? Well, now, these, what lives in the balloons can have objects, but also little arrows. Right, so, these now have category structure, and they're not necessarily discrete anymore. But now, because uh, these things are categories, and they have the structure of having objects and arrows, these uh, arrows between them are functors, and so they have to preserve that structure, right? So they have to take objects to objects, and arrows to arrows, in a manner that respects the boundaries and respects the compositional structure. If you remember back when we defined what a functor was. Okay, so let's give a little vocabulary here. When we have an index category like this, we call uh, C is the base category of the index category. Um, for an object in C, the category P of that object is called the fiber over or of X fiber. So here is an object in the base category, and here is a fiber over it. It's a whole category. And um, for F, an arrow in C, um, F of the star is called a reindexing functor. So it takes structure in one category and transports it to another. Uh, question? Yeah. Um, so we generalize 
mixed family who sets to contravariant set by eight hunters. Why contravariant? Ah, okay. So that was about what I was just about to say. Okay. Uh, the contravariance is totally inessential to what's going on, right? Because every category has an opposite category, right? So I could have, instead of writing C op, I could have just written D, but in my sort of, in my mind, known that whatever I wanted, I, whatever I wanted uh, C to be, I just choose its op to be the domain of the functor, right? So we'll see in a moment when we try to interpret um, like the term language of uh, first order logic, why it's more natural to have the domain of the functor be the opposite of the category that we actually have in mind. But it's just, it's, there's nothing, um, it's a convenience basically. And <coughs> is there another question or was it? The same? Yeah, when we generalize from sets, is it still, still called for sheet? No, now it's called index category. Okay, so when it's set value, it's a free sheet. When it's cat value, or in general, any category of category value, then it's an indexed category. And in particular, we will be interested in indexed by Cartesian closed categories, where here we go to ECC. Uh, so BCC, remember what a bi Cartesian closed category was from lecture three, maybe? Four, maybe? I don't remember. Um, and it had finite products, finite coproducts, and exponentials, right? So BCC is the category of small bi Cartesian closed categories. And in particular, that means the functors have to respect the bi Cartesian closed structure. They have to take products to products, exponentials to exponentials, terminal objects to terminal objects, and so on. Okay, so maybe it's worth writing down. get in a moment to interpreting <coughs> logic, we're going to end up having indexed categories P going from the opposite of some, okay, so indexed categories that land in B, C, C. So it, uh, indexed by Cartesian closed categories, right, where the fibers are each a by Cartesian closed category, and the indexing functors respect that Cartesian closed structure. Okay, so that's the setup. Now um, I have to tell you how to interpret a bunch of stuff. Uh, okay, so the first thing we have is if we want to do to do first order logic, right? Up until now we've done only propositional logic where our atomic. Uh, Propositions were just uninterpreted, like propositional variables, or if we had some constants, we could have that as well. But in predicate logic, we have you know, relation symbols on terms that, that give us our atomic predicates, and then from there we build up the propositions. So the first thing we need is a language of types and typing context. So we are going to 
focus on the logic and not on the type theory. So for us, we're just going to have atomic types. They come from an, which are an arbitrary set. So we have an arbitrary set T, right, that's like, has some typical elements. And we're not going to have any type formers. So the atomic types are going to be all the types we consider. And we don't have product types or anything like that. Although we could, by Curry Howard, now we know how to interpret product types because we know how to interpret conjunction. But let's keep it simple and say we just have atomic types. So to interpret an atomic type, we have to pick out an object in some category. Right, so the types are going to be objects. And we want this category, as we're going to see in a moment, to have finite products. So an interpretation of atomic, an atomic type is any object in the category which we're choosing to do our interpretation in, right? So someone asks you, what is the type nat? And you say it's this object. And they say, okay, what is the type string? And you say it's this object. If you do this, then you've given an interpretation to the atomic type. So next, we need to extend the interpretation of types to that of typing context. Start with types. Now we have typing contexts. And these act just the same way as the propositional contexts that we saw um, when we interpreted those, right? So we interpret the empty typing context as a terminal object, and we interpret the context extension as taking the product of the interpretation. It's just like when we did propositional context. But as I said there, we can either do it that way, which is sort of the biased way, or we can do the unbiased way. So let's do it that way. This is a little simpler. So if we have a typing context, and I guess I should say a typing context, right, is a list of distinct type variables. So that means x1 is a variable of type big X1. You know, each of these is a variable and it has a type, and the variables have to be distinct, although obviously the types need not be distinct. So typing contexts are lists of distinct uh, type variables. And their interpretations are just the finite product of the interpretations of the types of the variables. So you may ask, what happened to the variables themselves, right? The little x's are no longer here. Well, the names of the variables just allow us to project out of the product, right? The name of the variable is inessential. And we can see this in, in type theory because we almost always want to uh, consider terms up to alpha equivalent. We don't care about the names of the variables. We only care about their um, respective types. OK? So this makes sense. So far, we have some types, and we know how to interpret those. We make contexts out of types by making lists of variables that are given types, and then we interpret those as finite products of the interpretation of those types. OK. Now we have an operation on contexts. And I'm going to write that like this for reasons that will become clear maybe shortly. I'm going to write x with a little hat over it to mean the context phi. I'm going to refer to my typing context generally as this capital phi, right? Extended by x. 
and it's the map that takes that and just forgets about the x. So it just gives us back the context without that variable in it. And I think this notation comes from like linear algebra where you have a vector and you want to like suppress one of the one of the dimensions, you put a little half over it. Question? Usually in accepting context, the names of the variables matter but the order doesn't. Whereas here it's kind of the opposite. Well, the next thing I was about to say is that we assume that we have, we're, we're going to have exchange for our context as well. So the order will end up not mattering. But the other point that he made is valid. The names don't matter either, right? So the idea I want to give you is that the names are just the projections out of the context to the individual uh, factors of the context. And if you change, if you have the same context and you rename the variables and, and you do it consistently, so you do alpha renaming, then you haven't changed anything. You've given exactly the same thing. Okay, so now I have to tell you how to interpret this thing. So we interpret the context weakening. Well, we know that it, it has to go from the interpretation of the extended context, which is the interpretation of the prefix uh, and the product of that with the interpretation of x, right, to the interpretation of the context prefix. So, what term should this be? Right, it's the same as when we talked about weakening a propositional context, right, it's just the projection. I'll just write pi. Uh, it just, it's the obvious thing, right? It's the structural map that goes from the product to one of the factors. And that structural map is the projection. Okay. So now we've interpreted types and typing contexts and uh, weakening, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about exchange explicitly, I'm just going to assume that we can do exchange when we need to. I think it actually doesn't come up uh, in what I'm about to say, but if it does, just assume we can do it. So now, to finish the term language interpretation, right? we have to say what the terms are, and we build those inductively. So we start with function symbols. And those are an arity <laughs> indexed collection. And what I mean by that is a function symbol f will be in uh, the collection of function symbols with arity, say, y1 up to yn. And then here, and x. And what this means is, if you give the function symbol f arguments of types y1 up to yn, it should give you back a term of type x. Right, so these are the expected argument types, and this is the result type. You give it terms of these types, and it gives you back a term of this type. So it's, a, it's like the primitive maker of more terms out of other terms. Yes? Is this category all the No, this is not any kind of category. I just mean, like, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, indexing the function symbols by their arities, and their arities are these lists, right? So we have, for every natural number, a list of types of that length, and then a singleton here, right? So for any list of types that you can give as input, you get some like one type of output. So 
you give you give terms of these types, you get back a term of that type. And this is just like I, I think this is called is this the signature or something? I don't know exactly what this is called, but the point is that I guess it's just called the error key, right? It's it's telling you what it wants and what it will give you back. So? Yes? So the error key is usually n, right? So it's number of arguments. If so, if it were untyped, the arity would be a natural number. But if it's typed, then the natural number is not enough. You need like a list now, right? Where the natural number is the length of the list, but it's not just a list of units, because if, if it were untyped, it would be a list of units, which is a isomorphic to a natural number. But now you need a list of types telling you the type of each argument that it wants. Sounds like signature. Okay. Signature. Good. So well, whatever we call it, now let's say what we do to interpret these things, right? So if I have a function symbol, f, its interpretation is going to be some arrow from the interpretation of the product of its argument types to the interpretation of its result type. So if you provide any function that has the right boundary, that is the right typing, right, then that is a valid interpretation for that function symbol. You get to choose right, when you're making the interpretation. You primitively pick what you want to send the function symbol to. And then we inductively build the interpretation of terms. So how does that work? We have terms context, and what this means is that the terms can be open. They might have three variables in them. So the way that I'm going to write this is in typing context by term t has type x. Right? So that's how to read this. The by vertical bar t colon x means in typing context by term t has type x. And in particular, this means that Typing context 5 must contain all of the three variables that occur in term t. At least all of them. Okay, so now I need to tell you how to interpret that. And that's going to be some arrow from the interpretation of the context to the interpretation of the result type. But which one? Well, we have to answer that question inductively based on all the possible ways that we can make a term. So now we have several cases to consider. So one way we can make a term is by considering a variable as a term. So I'll write lifted variable. Right? So if we have a variable xi that is in the context already, then we need to say what is the interpretation in that context of xi, and okay, it should be type, right? Whatever its type is. So, I'll write it like this. Um, we have to say what is its interpretation. Okay, well, we know its boundary, so let's figure, let's write that out first. We know it has to go from the interpretation of the context to the interpretation of its type, which is xi. And which such arrow should it be? Exactly. So I kind of gave it away before, where I said the, very, the, the names of the, the type variables are just um, 
labels for the factors, right? So this is just the i projection telling us how to look that variable up in the context. Okay, so the next way we can make a term is by applying a function symbol to uh, some terms. So here, suppose we have a function symbol f, that wants y as its input and gives us x as output, and we have terms in context by term i has type y. So now the game is we have to interpret in context by the function symbol f applied to the t's. I'll write the shorthand like this. So this is the vector of t's, right? And this should have type x because of the definition of the interpretation of function symbols. So what should this be? Well, let's see what we know. Right? We know that we have it's going to be something. Here we have the interpretation of the y. And from here, the interpretation of the function symbol takes us the interpretation of x. Right? That we know because that's by assumption of interpretation of function symbols. And now we want to go from the interpretation of the context somehow to the interpretation of x. Well, we could do that if we had an arrow from here to here, right? Then we could just compose with the interpretation of the function symbol. But we also know, by assumption, that we have these terms, and we know their types. Right? Their types are from the interpretation of the context to the interpretation of the respective y. Right? So what we can do is just tuple these. take that tuple, then we go from the interpretation of the context to the product of the interpretations of the y's, and then we just compose that with the f to get the interpretation of the function symbol applied to those terms. Does this make sense? Okay. Uh, the next way we can make a term is by context weakening or context extension, depending on your point of view. So here we have terms uh, we have the term T context phi and a variable that's not in that context. And what we want is an interpretation of t, but in the extended context, with a new fresh variable, with a dummy variable added. Right? So, sorry, I guess I should have given this y its type. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, let's see what we have and what we need. Right? We have, by assumption, the interpretation of 
T, which goes from the interpretation of the context to the interpretation of the result type. So that's T, that's what we have, right? And what we want is to go from <coughs> the product of the interpretations of the context and the new, the type of the new brush variable to X. But we can do that if we could just get from here to here, because then we just compose to the interpretation of T, and we get an arrow of the type we want. Okay? So how can we get from the product of the interpretations of phi and y to the interpretation of phi? Well, we just take the projection, but we had a name for that, if you remember. That was the interpretation of forgetting y. So this is called the single omission of y. <coughs> we just forget about one variable. Okay. There's one more case to consider. So in this case, we have terms uh, T in a context with a variable Y in it. And S in that context without Y in it, but S has type Y in that context. So now what we want is to interpret T with Y sent to S. Right? So this is my substitution notation of type S. Okay, so let's write down what we have and what we want and see if we can fill the gap. So we know that we have the interpretation of T We have the interpretation of T right from its the interpretation of its context to the interpretation of its type and what we want is some arrow from the interpretation of that context without the y to the interpretation of x. So again, if we could just fill this gap, then we could compose and we'd be done. So how can we fill this gap? Well, going from the interpretation of b to the interpretation of b is pretty easy. right? So if we make a tuple here, then we can put identity in the first component. And then how can we get from the interpretation of E to the interpretation of Y? Well, we have by assumption a term S that has just that type, right? So we just make this twofold. The identity takes us from E to the first factor. The interpretation of S takes us from E to the second factor. And when we twofold that, we get the unique map into the product. Question? Uh, just a quick notation confirmation. Uh, that Y arrow S, what does that mean? Oh, okay, so this, this is how I like to write substitution. You can read this as S or Y. Uh, I guess Bob and Frank use this, right? Okay, so this is the same thing as bracket S or Y in T, I think, is the notation they were using. Okay, if you really like, I can try to use this notation, it's just I'm not used to it, so I might slip. <laughs> 
Okay, so this is just higher representation uh, substitution. Okay. So we're going to name this thing. Well, okay, before we name it, let's think about why this is the right thing, right? So we substituted the term s for the variable y in t. But here we have this identity. So why should it be that we we tuple this thing with the identity? Like, how do we know that there's not some other error we should be applying here instead? Well, semantically, we know that when we substitute one term for a variable in some other term, right, it should leave the other variables of the term undisturbed. It shouldn't, for example, permute them or do something else weird to them, right? It should leave them alone. And that's why we have to pass through the rest of the context using the identity function on it so we don't mess with any of the other variables that might be in the context. And so we're going to call this thing, um, so interpreting just, sorry, substituting just one term for a variable is what I'll call a single substitution. So that is like uh, this, right? Substituting just one term for a variable. And I'm going to call its interpretation. So I'm going to call this arrow the interpretation of a single substitution. So the arrow in comma interpretation of S is the single sub the is okay, so the interpretation of the single substitution. Sorry. The interpretation of the single substitution is going to be defined to be this. Area. Before we go on to the uh, propositional part of the language, does anyone have questions about the term part? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is identical on you. So it's like polymorphic in key. Okay. So now we need to talk about the. Um, the predicate part of the language, because uh, unlike in propositional logic, right now the atomic propositions are no longer just propositional variables, but they are some kind of relation symbols applied to some terms. So now we have to define those and then interpret. some relation symbols, and those will be uh, another arity indexed collection, and that will be a relation symbol. R will be in the collection of relation symbols indexed by some types x1 up to xn, oops, I never write that. Right? So this says that R is a relation symbol, and it's n -ary, first of all, but furthermore, it's typed n -ary. so it's telling you what are the types of each of the arguments that it wants. So the intuition here is that when you apply such a relation symbol to terms of these types, then you get an atomic proposition, i.e. a relation, uh, uh, predicate, sorry. Um, so I'm going to call a predicate and atomic property. 
Okay, so when you apply a relation symbol to terms of the right number and type, then you get back an, an atomic proposition, which I will henceforth call a predicate. Okay? So now we have to say how to interpret these things. So, first of all, before we can do that, uh, if C is a Cartesian category interpreting the term language, in the way I just described, and P is an index category from C BCC, so it's a C indexed by Cartesian closed category. Right? So the base category is the category interpreting our term language, and now there's fibers, each of which is a by Cartesian closed category. Then we interpret R to be any object in the fiber over the product of the interpretations. of the types that that predicate symbol expects, right? So for example, if we have a predicate symbol that's prime, and it's, so if prime is in R over N, where N is some type, then the interpretation of prime so, and here's the, interpret here's the interpretation of N in C. Here's P of the interpretation of N. Right? And then the interpretation of prime will be some object in that fiber. And the reason why we have to index this way right, is because prime want, expects one argument of, well, intuitively we'll think of it as natural numbers, but whatever the type n is supposed to be, right? prime expects one argument of type n, and so its interpretation has one free variable of that type. That's why it has to be indexed in the fiber over, uh, in general, the, the list of its signature. Okay, so just as we had terms in context that could contain three variables ranging over types, now we can have propositions or predicates so far in context that can have three variables ranging over uh, types. So, uh, right? Yeah, okay, so now we have propositions in context. So, we have a typing context phi, and I will write phi r a prop for the judgment that A is a proposition, all of whose free <coughs> type variables are in the typing context phi. And so this is the typing context. This is a proposition. And this is the judgment that this is a proposition. Question. Um, so P, is that supposed to be part of our interpretation that we think? The P? This yeah. one? Yeah, that P. So the, the goal is we're trying to interpret um, 
predicate logic so far in a particular bi-Cartesian closed or an indexed bi-Cartesian closed category. So we kind of have to do this in stages, right? Because we don't know how to interpret the predicates until we first know how to interpret the terms, and we don't know how to do that until we know how to interpret the types. So first, we interpret the types in some category C. Then we, as objects. Then we interpret the terms as arrows in that category. Now we choose some index by Cartesian closed category where that category C is the base. And now I'm going to tell you how to interpret eventually all of the propositions as objects in the correct fiber over the, um, the interpretation of their typing context. Okay? So it's, it's like a step-by-step -step process. We have to like do one, there's a dependency relationship here. Question? Would you mind writing down the full term language that you're going to interpret? Sorry? Can you write down the term language, the, the predicate language you're going to uh, you can have any term language you want, right? You just start with whatever collection of atomic types that you want, you get to choose. Then you choose a set of function symbols based on those atomic types that you chose. So you can't choose a function symbol that has a type that's not in the list of atomic types, right? And then you choose the relation symbols. So, I mean, this is all parametric in what the language is. And then you have connectives? Yeah, well, we talked about connectives uh, on Wednesday and Thursday pretty extensively, right? But yes, so we already know the story for connectives, and so now I have to tell you the rest of the story, basically. Question? How do we interpret the objects in C off that correspond to our propositions? The, okay, so the propositions are not going to live in C or C off, they're going to live yeah. in the fibers over yeah. there. Can I just connect the objects in C off? Yes. So how do we interpret those objects and those long events? The, do you mean the things in the fibers? The, the predicates? The things that index the fibers. Well, that's what I just told you, right? The, they're the, type, the typing context. So okay. you build, you start with the types, which are any objects you get to choose. Now you build typing context out of those by finite products. And then I told you how to interpret terms inductively, assuming that you've given me interpretations of the function symbols. Yeah. Okay, so now we have an interpretation of the whole term language. And now we're talking about the predicate language over this term language. But I haven't finished that yet, I'm in the middle of it. Okay, let me continue, and then if it's, when I get to the end of the predicate language, if you still have questions, then I'll take them. Okay, so we have propositions in context, and now we have to say how to interpret those. Right? So, the interpretation of a proposition in context should be an object in the fiber over the interpretation of the context. So you get to choose, right? Once you've chosen P, your index by Cartesian closed category, for each, uh, oh, wait, well, well, sorry, I said that wrong. Okay, so I'm going to tell you how to do this inductively once you've chosen how to interpret the uh, relation symbol. So now we have to inductively say how to interpret like all of the uh, propositions. Relations. 
times y. Terms in context phi, ti, and have the types y's, we need to say how to interpret in context phi that r applied to the t's is a problem. Make sense? So, here's what we know. We know that in the context over, sorry, in the fiber over the product of the interpretations of the y's, in this fiber, we have the interpretation of the relation symbol. Right? We know that because this is what it wants, and this is the interpretation, and it puts in this fiber. We want something in this fiber to be the interpretation of the relation symbol applied to these terms. right? But we also have here this arrow that is the interpretation of, sorry, that is the tuple of the interpretations of the terms. Remember, we have this uh, from uh, the interpretation of. Uh, terms is something of the corresponding type from the uh, interpretation of the context. So if we tuple them, then we can get to the product of all the types. So now, if we just re-index by this thing, right, this thing gives us a re-indexing functor. So this re-indexing functor determined by this sends the interpretation of all over here. And this is what we define to be the interpretation of R with uh, of the T. <laughs> Got it? So we, we start with what we're given, the interpretation of the relation symbol. We know we have this arrow because we can build it out of the interpretations of the terms. And so if we re-index it by, if we re-index the interpretation of the relation symbol, <laughs> by the tuples that we can build out of the interpretation of these terms, then we're calling that the interpretation of the relation symbol applied to the terms, which is now an atomic proposition or a predicate. Okay. It's kind of a mouthful. Uh, that. Wait, so feet can't have any variables that, like, say, the relation symbol? Sorry? Feet can't have any variables. So B is a typing context, so there's not going to be anything to do with relation symbols, right? This is just going to be like typing. This is going to be things like x1 has type x1, xn has type xn, something like that. So it's going to be probably relation symbols. No. So the relation symbols are part of the logic. Right? The logical language is dependent on the typing language, but it's distinct from it. So when Bob was telling you about this kind of dependence, he kind of uh, said it's like, you know, uh, it's not full dependence. It's not as, we, we, for example, we can't make the sigma types and the pi types that Bob was telling you about. All we can do is talk about predicates that range over objects of types. So for example, I give the the prime predicate, right? It wants a natural number. I haven't talked about proofs yet at all. I'm only telling you how to interpret the language, not, not the, the logic yet. Okay? Question? Um, I'm trying to understand the significance of each of those circles in relation to what's below them. So, 
This is the base category, C, where we interpret the, the types and typing contexts as objects and the terms as arrows. Well, and then yet other arrows inductively built out of those. Okay, and then here is the fiber, so this is BCC, so this is the fiber over this uh, C object, right? and this is the fiber over this C object. So I think Bob wrote the fiber as it's like a vertical line with some dots on it, but to give myself more space, I'm writing it as these balloons. It just means that this is the category, the bicartesian closed category, that the functor P sends this object to. <coughs> Question. Uh, so the presentation here seems not to allow nullary relations and sure. propositions. It, it can. So this can just be the empty list here. Right? And then that would be interpreted as so the interpretation of the empty list is the terminal object. So then you would have a proposition over the terminal object. So that would be something that doesn't depend on any uh, any argument. It's just a problem. It's a proposition without. Uh, so it's not it's not a proper predicate. It's just a proposition. Okay. So let me just finish uh, the cases here. an applied relation symbol. Next we can have a context extension. And what I mean by that is for a proposition A in context phi and a variable not in that context we want to interpret A as a proposition in this extended context right so we added a new dummy variable to the context one that doesn't actually occur in A so how do we do that? Well, we know by assumption that in the fiber over the interpretation of the original context, we have the interpretation of A. That's what this is telling us. We know that we have over here the interpretation of the extended context. and it has a fiber. And what we want is to re-index A somehow into this fiber. So what arrow should we use to re-index by? Well, that means we need an arrow that goes in this direction, right, from the extended context to the original context. And the arrow that we want is the interpretation of the single omission of Y. Right, the projection, to say more simply. And so we can, if we, we know we always have that arrow, so we can re-index by it here, and get the interpretation of A, and syntactically, right, this looks like I'm saying the same thing as this, but you see that this is the interpretation of A in the original context, whereas this is the interpretation of A in the extended context. Okay, so that's just, that's just context weakening for propositions. And the last case we have, uh, let me just go over here, is term substitution. So in this case, we have. Uh, for proposition 
proposition A in a context with a variable Y and a term that has type Y in the context that can be extended <coughs> by Y to get to be the context of A. Okay? And now we want to interpret in the context by the proposition A with Y substituted for this term X. So let's draw what we have and what we want. So we know in the in the fiber of the extended context, we have A, the interpretation thereof. And what we want is in the fiber over the interpretation of phi, we want the interpretation of A where Y gets substituted for S. So we need to re-index by some arrow here that will allow us to do that. Yes, uh, Oops. Okay, so S is what I wanted. So I wrote here T. So this should be S. Sorry. S, 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 S. Okay, now I'm consistent. Okay, and so what arrow should this be? Sorry? Well, we, we have a name for it already, right? This is the interpretation of the single substitution of S for Y. And this was that thing that was the tuple of in and interpretation of right, Those are the same. This is just the name for it. Question? Yes, so when you write A with Y goes to S, is that Y goes to S a piece of syntax, or do you mean the result of applying the substitution to A? So this is a good question. Um, it can actually go either way. So if you have explicit substitution in your language, then uh, it will make something that it will make the eventual, eventual con construct easier. If you don't have um, explicit substitution in your language, then there ends up being something called, uh, a, a, well, there ends up being a coherence issue called soundness for syntax. And that is because the reindexing functor, or, or sorry, because the, the bi-Cartesian closed functors, right, they correspond to the propositional connectives respect um, products and co-products and exponentials, uh, they, you will have the case that the interpretation of a term with its substitution will be isomorphic to the interpretation of the subterms with their substitutions and then the interpretation of the connectives, but it may not be like on the nose exact. So what I mean is, if I have A and B with, uh, say, we have uh, Y goes to S. And I take the interpretation of this whole thing. It will always be isomorphic to uh, the interpretation of A with Y goes to S product the interpretation of B with Y goes to S. But whether this is identity or not is kind of a subtle issue. So you can always sort of rig it so it will be, but that requires some sort of technical ingenuity. Um, so the point is that if you had explicit substitution in your language, you, you could use that to, to mediate this isomorphism. But if you don't, then you have to do something else. <coughs>
So, uh, right? So, okay, so that's explaining how to uh, substitute a term for a variable in a proposition. And we already know how to interpret the propositional connectives. So now, if I haven't skipped anything, then we know how to interpret um, propositions in context. Once we have given to us the interpretations of the atomic types, the function symbols, and the relation symbols. Right, so everything else is built up inductively. Okay, so the last topic I want to talk to you about is how to make this into um, an interpretation of all of first order logic. So what we're missing is the quantifiers. And it was a very uh, beautiful insight by a guy named Bill Laver in the 60s that the quantifiers could be interpreted as adjoints to a context weakening function, right? So a reindexing functor determined by a context weakening. That's not at all obvious. Um, and it's really interesting that it's true. Um, so that's basically what I want to explain to you in the rest of the time. And when I prepared this lecture, I thought that Frank might, well, when I was preparing this course, I mean, I thought that Frank might like tell you about quantification in his lectures, but I talked to him and realized that that wasn't the case. So here we have kind of an interesting um, like, uh, order of, of presentation in that I'm going to tell you what the adjunctions tell us that the rules for quantifiers ought to be, right? And then we'll just see if that seems reasonable because we don't have anything to compare it to. Well, I mean, we do. We can look it up, but let's let's sort of do it backwards, right? Let's let's discover quantification from the point of view of the adjunctions. So here's the picture for quantifiers in the base category. Remember, interpreting our term language. This is some kind of Cartesian category. We have the interpretation of some type in context. We also have the interpretation of the extended type in context extended by a new variable. And remember, this is just the product of the interpretations. And here we have the interpretation of the single omission, where we just forget about the variable. So that's just the projection. This gives rise to fibers. So here, okay, so this, let's call this P, the index category. And P of <coughs> of phi, that's that fiber, and here is the fiber P of the interpretation of the extended context. And now, this arrow that we know exists in C, because C has finite products, therefore it has to have projections, and the interpretation of a single omission is just a projection. This has a reindexing functor. Called x hat upper star, right? Remember the convention that the upper star was the name of the reindexing functor? Okay, so this guy, if he has adjoints on both the left and the right, well, it doesn't have to be on both sides, but, but I'm going to tell you what they would, what the, if it had it on both sides, what they would be. This would be, the right one would be the interpretation of the universal quantifier. And the left one would be the interpretation of the existential quantifier. Question? Okay, so it is, but that's why I drew the arrows here this way. I mean, if I write C off, then I have to draw the arrows the other way too. So I want to draw the arrows as the way C sees them, right? But because the index category is contravariant, the, this arrow is going the opposite way from its reindexing. 
what P is not from C I. Yeah, so okay, there's like not really a good way to de denote this notationally, right? What I should so P is going from C off to BCC, but I'm drawing the diagram here in C rather than in C off because it would be too confusing to like always remember that the arrows are okay. the opposite of the arrows in C. That's why P, okay, so I'll say contravariant, right? P contravariant. Okay? Okay, so this is the big picture. And now let's see what this means for at least the universal quantifier. happen to know that we want what's called a negative presentation for universal quantification, and I won't go into that right now, but what that tells me is that we want to use the universal property of the co-product presentation of an injunction in order to, um, to read off the, the rules for this connective, right? So let's remind ourselves how that works. This says that um, Okay, so if we're looking now at this adjunction, the one between the weakening, context weakening and uh, universal quantification. So this says that if in this category, Now on, I'm not going to write the interpretation brackets around everything, first because it's slow and boring, and second of all because like, we're discovering what the, the syntax corresponding to the semantics should be in, the, in scare quotes, so anyway, I'm, I'm not going to write um, semantic brackets anymore. Okay? So for every arrow from the left adjoint functor, apply to any object that I take from uh, here, what you do by ejection, right, between the categories P of B, that's the fiber over P, and the extended fiber, those two bubbles on the sideboard. So for any object gamma that lives here, and any arrow from the left adjoint functor, which is the um, weakening, the re-indexing functor determined by weakening, uh, to an object here, let's say A, and let's call this thing B. There is a unique arrow from that object alone to the right adjoint functor, so I just told you that should be for all X, X, such that, such that what? Such that the universal property of the co-unit holds. So let's remind ourselves what that is. We have um, a natural transformation, uh, epsilon, going from the composition of the right followed by the left adjoint functors to the identity functor on this category. Right. So that means that we go from um, X at star of all X A to A, and this is the component of this natural transformation at A. Right? So do you see why this is, here I start with A, and the first thing I do is I apply the right adjoint functor to it, so I get for all X A, and then I apply the left adjoint functor to it, and I get the, the weakening. So that's saying I do the natural transformation from this composition to the identity. Okay? And then the universal property says that if I, this, so this is called the flat in my musical notation. This says that the diagram x hat star of the flat composed with the component of the co-unit, 
is just the original arrow D. Okay, that's that's just I, I've just specialized the universal property of the co-unit of an adjunction to this particular adjunction. That's all I've done so far. And now let's make some inference rules. So at the end of last time, I told you that we could read off candidate inference rules anyway from the, directly from the adjunction. And I said that for negatively connected connectives, such as this, right, that the introduction rule should be flat. So, intro rule. It should be the flat operation. So let's see how that goes, right? This says that if I have a derivation, of A from gamma in which the variable x doesn't occur, right? And we know it doesn't occur because we're weakening by it. Then, by flat, we take this derivation we cancel it, we trade it in, we get our ticket punched, right? And we get to turn it into a derivation where we move the left adjoint functor from the domain, so we go from gamma, and we add the right adjoint functor to the codomain. So we go 2 for all x, <coughs> x, a. And this is our candidate for all intro rules. Do you see how I mechanically constructed this rule from the universal property of the co-unit. Well, I didn't even need the universal property, right? I just need the bijection between D and D flat so far. But it's saying, I take this derivation, right? I plump it over here. I close its assumptions because I'm trading it in, right? I'm trading it in because I'm moving to the other category. I'm creating a, an arrow, a primitive derivation in the other category. And that arrow is going from gamma to for all x, x, a. Okay, so let's think about what this is saying semantically, right? This is saying that if I can infer a from assumptions in which I know x doesn't occur, and I know x doesn't occur because I've weakened the context by x, then I can infer for all x, a from those assumptions. Does this seem like a reasonable inference rule for introduction of universal quantifier? Yes? So do you view the whole context gamma as a proposition now here? Yeah, so the, this is the, the uh, as I was doing the connectives on Wednesday and Thursday, I had this sort of notational mismatch, right, where I needed some way to notate the, um, the context of assumptions. And you can sort of think of this as like putting it off to the side or something, but it's, it's, it's notating the new context of assumptions that we have, uh, which may be different from the old context of assumptions. Because in the categories, we're, we're changing to a different category. And the way we change is by applying some functor, right? And in this case, the functor is, well, okay. Uh, in this, well, actually, we're changing by taking the adjoint complement. So what that does is it removes the left adjoint functor from the domain and applies the right adjoint functor to the codomain, right? So I'm not sure what to say about the notation, right? Obviously, this is not valid natural deduction. If we had the localized version, then we could we could just say like from x at star gamma turnstile a, we get from gamma turnstile 
X can occur in A because look what, what category does A live in, right? It lives in the fiber over the extended context. The extended context has a variable X in it. So X is allowed to occur in A. But X is not allowed to occur in gamma because gamma lives in the fiber over the context that doesn't have an X. Um, so I'm having a little trouble understanding, um, just from the pictures up there, what things we know and what things we're deriving from those things. Is it the case that we're, we're just saying the, the diagram that you've drawn up on the other board is um, like what has to be so if there's um, an adjunct to this context uh, weakening thing, and then we figure out what that adjunct is? Um, partially, yes. Okay. So. I'm asserting that if there is an adjoint to context weakening, in this case a right adjoint, then that behaves <laughs> like a universal quantifier. Okay? So having a right adjoint means satisfying the universal property of the co-unit. This was one of the three conditions, equivalent conditions I gave you to characterize an adjunction last time. And so I'm saying that the, I'm, I'm uh, introducing the, the proposal that the introduction rule for um, this connective should be interpreted by the flat natural bijection. And what the flat natural bijection does is it takes a derivation or an arrow, right? Because the derivation is interpreted as an arrow. It takes an arrow from the left adjunct functor applied to any object in the, the first category, the P of phi, to uh, what is that? Yeah, the left adjunct functor applied to that to any object in the second category, in this case, the fiber of the extended context, and it turns it into, so maybe, let me use a different color, okay. but this stuff is going on in uh, P of uh, the extended uh, context, right? That's how, this is a derivation in that category, and this part is now a new derivation in this category. So you've traded a derivation in one category for a derivation in the other category in this very controlled way, this way that says um, you can trade by removing the left adjoint functor here if you agree to add the right adjoint functor there. And then you can go back and forth because that's a natural bijection because that's one of the three conditions that I gave you for being an adjunction. Okay, let me go on and we can think about this more. Uh, right. Um, <coughs> let's think about the elimination rule. Let me erase this. So I will propose that this should be interpreted by the co-unit of the adjunction. So what does that mean? It means we take a proposition A and we apply the component of the co-unit to it. So this should go from the weakening of all x A to A. That's just this arrow but now written as an inference rule. So let's think about this, because this is probably not what we were expecting. So over the context, the original context V, we have <coughs> the proposition for all XA. Over the extended context, extended context, extended by the weakening, we have the weakening of the universal quantification, and here we have the era epsilon going to A. This is the co-unit at A. Now, if we had a term 
in context B of type X, then we could perform the single substitution, X goes to T, and we could re-index this whole arrow, this domain, this domain, and the shaft, right, by this single substitution. So what happens if we re-index the codomain? We get A with X going to T. If we re-index epsilon, we get epsilon with A with X going to T. What happens if we re-index the weakening by X for all X A by the single substitution X goes to T? must be just for all x a. Why? Because we weaken by x, right? So x does not occur in for all x a. So if we substitute something for x, which does not occur in for all x a, we're just going to end up with the same thing we started with. So we can see that sort of um, from the point of view of the, of the logic, but we can also see it from the point of view of the category theory, because this composition has to be the identity arrow. Can someone tell me why? Remember the interpretation of the single substitution was the tuple of the identity with the interpretation of a term. And the interpretation of this is a projection. So if I do, if I do the tuple of id and anything, and then I apply pi zero to it, then I just get id, right? So there's no choice. Okay, so the usual rule that we see for, for all to live is usually, so compare this to something like for all x a uh, and then t, is something of type x, and then we can conclude uh, a with x going to t. Okay. This is a typical feeling rule presentation for universal quantification. I think um, I defer to people who know more about this than me. But so all this is saying is we can take the rule that we that the adjunction spit out and re-index it by any term t. Right? So this is just, to finish off, this is the re-indexing of this by this. So our rule, re-indexed by any single substitution, will give this version of the rule. But why is this version of the rule interesting? Well, it doesn't tell us that we have to pick the term t to re-index by right away. Right? We might not know which, so I think this is called in, the, in this field the representative to pick. Right? We might not know which representative we want to choose to instantiate our universal quantifier. Until later, we might find out as we proceed you know, further along in our proof, oh, I actually wanted this one. And with this rule, we don't have to decide. We can continue our derivation in the fiber over this extended context until later, when we potentially might know which representative we want to pick, then at any point, we can re-index the entire derivation we've gotten by that single substitution interpreting that representative and move our, inter uh, move our derivation back into the fiber where we wanted it. So this allows us basically to use this context variable as a meta variable in our, in our ambient proof system. So we can, we can do derivations in different typing contexts, and we can choose when we want to re-index between them by a single substitution. Okay, so this version of the rule is interesting in that it <coughs> has implications for um, uh, like trying to do strategies for proof search because it tells you basically that you can defer some choices until later in your proof. Okay, let me just do two more things and then I'll let you go.
let's look at what reduction tells us. Oh no, this is exactly what I wanted to moderate. <laughs> Uh, okay. Let me erase that. Uh, gamma was here. This was D class. Here we had D. Here we had the weakening of gamma. And here we had uh, the weakening of D class. The reason that I wanted to not erase this is because the uh, local reduction should be interpreted by the commuting of this triangle. Right? So let's see what that says. It's saying if I do the weakening of the adjoint complement and compose it with the component of the co-unit, I just get the original derivation. So suppose D is a derivation from the weakening of the context to A. And what's the first thing we do to it? We flatten it. Right? So to flatten it, it means we apply the intro rule, or our version of it anyway. And that means we take off the left adjoint functor here, and we add the right adjoint functor here. Okay? So, so far I've done just this bit. Flat. What's the next thing we do? We re-index by this weakening. So that means I go from x at star of the of the premises. I go from the weakening of the uh, assumptions to weakening of the conclusion. So that's uh, okay. And what's the last thing I do? I apply the component of the co-unit, which takes us from this to this. So now I just include A, and this was the rule that I'm proposing. And that this thing should just be the original derivation that we had before, right? That's the commuting of this triangle, which I have previously called uh, beta sub r. So by beta sub r, this just goes to the original derivation. Okay, so this is kind of a local reduction, right? but it's one where we never have to choose the representative term. So it's a little different from the version that you'll see um, in a typical presentation. Universal one time. And let me just do a local expansion and I'm done. So the local expansion for an identity derivation says that this is the self probing thing where if we take the identity derivation. Um, for all x, x, a, that this should be the component of the co-unit flattened. Okay, so what does the identity derivation on for all x, x, a look like? The identity derivation just looks like that, right? It has zero input rules. It's assumptions, R, it's conclusion. And now what happens if we do this, right? The, Component of the co unit says that we go from to A by the limb, limb. And now to flatten it, we apply the intro rule. And so what do we do there? We remove the left adjoint functor oops, let me give myself more space, from the assumptions. And we add the right adjoint functor to the conclusion. So I'm just saying that if I do nothing 
to this proposition. It's first, it's the same thing as first, uh, well, okay, it's this derivation, right? It's, in, it's introducing it where the, the way we got to A in the first place was by eliminating uh, from the weakening of the universal quantification. Okay, so I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments, we should have to discuss. That is an interesting question, and one that I'm not going to be able to talk about. Um, I can point you to a paper. So notice I didn't, for example, I didn't talk about inductive types at all, right? We never interpreted something like the natural numbers. All we interpreted was first order logic. And still, I mean, it still has though, a lot of the, the building blocks that go into more sophisticated categorical semantics, right? Like, if you want to interpret dependent type theory, you need a much more sophisticated notion of dependence, not just this uh, one level of dependence where you have categories indexed by a category, I said in dependent types, everything that occurs later in a context can depend on everything that occurred earlier in that context. So you have this uh, like um, stacking, right, of things indexed by things, indexed by things, indexed by things. And what you need to do is find some way to sort of tie them up so that that long, potentially kind of an arbitrarily long list of dependencies is just sort of one categorical system. And that's the hard thing to do, but but there have been people who have given semantics for this. There are several different ones that are similar but slightly different. Okay. Anything else? Yes? Are there any other for you to mention that um, group search that uh, is quite a flexible thing in direction? So are there any other intuitions or sort of applications? Yeah, so here's one thing, right? So there's, in, in the field of proof search, there's this idea called focusing, which tells you sort of when you have a, a partially uh, constructed derivation, and you now need to choose what rule to apply next and where to apply it to the, um, to the fringe of the tree, the, the list of open uh, goals, right? That to make a choice as to where to apply a rule and what rule to apply. So one thing that we see immediately from the adjoint semantics uh, of the connectives is that for the negatively presented connectives, that is the universal quantifier, the conjunction, and the implication, and the um, truth, that the um, introduction rule is this natural bijection of homicides, right? Because it's a natural bijection, however many proofs there are of the goal before you apply that rule, you'll have exactly the same number of proofs still available to you after you apply that rule. So you could not have made a bad choice and applied the wrong rule. So it's always safe to apply those rules. So in, in the subject of focusing, this is known as an inversion phase. And, at, and when you're in an inversion phase, you apply the rules that you know are always safe to apply. And this gives us sort of a semantic way of seeing which of those rules are safe to apply. They're exactly the ones that are um, that are adjoint complements in the interpretations. Okay, thanks.